Welcome to Growing Up Beverly Hills. I'm Stacy, And I'm David. We grew up together in Beverly Hills in the 1980s. Forget what you've seen in the movies or TV shows. We have the real stories about real people growing up in Beverly Hills. Here's a little known fact for you. There aren't any talking chihuahuas. <laughs> Beverly Hills folk drop a lot of names of people and places. We just can't help it. Don't worry, we'll explain it all at the end of the interview in the Beverly Hills Breakdown. Enjoy, subscribe, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Stacy, how are you? David, I'm so glad that we're back. Good to see you. It's been a while. Yes, it has. We were very fortunate to have Big Shot Hollywood director John Turtletop talk with us. He was a senior when we were freshmen at Beverly High, and he kept us laughing. He's directed a ton of films, including his first big break, Three Ninjas, which led to cool runnings. Then he went on to direct Phenomenon with John Travolta, The Kid with Bruce Willis, and the National Treasure films with his old classmate, Nicolas Cage. That's just naming a few of his movies. He also produces and directs TV shows such as Jericho, He gives us all the inside scoop on being a director from BH, and we also discuss his father, who was a legendary writer on The Carol Burnett Show, Sanford and Son, and What's Happening. We also get into some of the humanitarian efforts he does to give back. So, David, it's that time. Let's listen to John. Let's do it. You ready, David? I'm ready. Oh, that's very bad. I'm in the middle of a podcast, not listening, recording. Okay, I'll be right back. Bye. <laughs> On that note, John Turtletop, welcome to Growing Up Beverly Hills. We are thrilled to have you on today. Way overly doing the adjectives right now. That's Stacy. That's who that's she is. me. <laughs> the, I'm the extra adjective. All right, that's good. That's good. I'm excited. So now I know everyone made you this excited. Jeez. Oh, well, I'm not going to say everybody, John, but you're really high up on the list, I got to tell you. One day I want to see this list and see just how Beverly Hills I am. Oh, you're very Beverly Hills. You're up on my list because we were freshmen when you were a senior, and I kind of thought you were kind of a big shot. I what do you mean was kind of? I was an amazing senior when you were a total loser. Your brother <laughs> was a, a, a junior at Beverly High when I was a senior. You were just a freshman, and I was all kinds of awesome. That's, That's true. true. We'll that get into true. that later. But first, we'd like to start with how your family got to Beverly Hills in the first place. Well, we were New York people, New Jersey people. My dad te- was a television writer. And the television business was kind of done in New York and moving. Everything was moving to Los Angeles and L.A. This is now 1966. I was three at that time. And so... My uh, family packed up and moved out to L.A. My dad's first thing here was, I think, a variety show for the big star uh, Pat Boone. From there started just being a a TV writer and quickly getting into things like the Carl Burnett show and and, and stuff like that. So the whole family moved out. Um, I think it was rough, for especially for my mom. I think it was especially at that time, but even now, in some ways, it's a lot easier for husbands than wives to move. Wives were stuck with the kids and no friends. Yeah. Guys have work friends, but let's be honest. Those are our only friends. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, it's a lot easier. Um, but, uh, you know, moving to LA and then and Beverly Hills, and it wasn't necessarily, our first house was, Beverly Hills post office. I think it was up past Coldwater park up Beverly drive. Yeah. Um, That was, I remember living there when I was three and then we moved to a house on Coldwater Canyon when I was four. So you grew up in Coldwater Canyon. What element? I did. I went to, I went to Hawthorne and it sucked. And I'm going to tell you why it's living on Coldwater. (laughs) Because like the sunset Boulevard might as well have been the grand Canyon, right? If you lived in the flats, you walked to friend's house and took a bike to friend's house and the helmsman came by and then you went to the ice cream guy and that was all great. Right. If you lived above sunset, it was a deal. It was dangerous. And, and I could take my bike sometimes, but usually when I, if I, my brother and I walked to school, my parents would follow us because we for sure we were going to get killed crossing. Right. 
I was jealous of all my friends who lived in the flats. Now, we had it much better than those losers up in Truesdale. <laughs> That's right. They were way far away, and you couldn't even take a bike from there, from where I was on cold, cold water. We were down the bottom, so it wasn't so bad, but it was still a thing. Yeah, for sure. Canyon living was very hard, especially back then. Yeah, for a kid. For everyone else, awesomeness. Yeah, totally. So your dad had this completely amazing career. You mentioned the Carol Burnett show. That was certainly an amazing experience. Do you remember that ex when he was working on that or you were too young? I remember going with him once to Television City in Hollywood. That was CBS on Fairfax, which is still almost sort of there. And getting to go there. And he'd go there for other things like writing TV specials and stuff for like Phyllis Diller or Perry Como or whatever it was. But my first early, early memory is when he was producing That Girl. Uh, that was in Hollywood. And I remember going to the set and, and, and I got, he had, there was a part in a, an episode and I was five, six years old and they needed a little kid and I was doing it. And then the night before I panicked and thought, I'm going to do oh. it badly and ruin my dad's show. And I backed out and I didn't realize probably <laughs> backing out was probably worse than doing a bad job. <laughs> exactly. Right. How do I find another kid? Terrified. I had to find a kid at the last minute. What did I know? I was five. Now I'm a big shot director and I would have killed that little boy. <laughs> <laughs> so then he goes on to do Love American Style, Sanford mm -hmm. and Son, What's Happening, Kate and Allie. Yeah. Just a huge string of hits. Amazing. Very good. All good. And and fun. And, you know, it, it, you, go, oh, you grew up on a set. No, you didn't. You grew up going to school. Yeah. Right. On the set. You, nobody went to the set. And I those days, though, you know, it was sitcoms and they were done for a live audience. So mm -hmm. when the tapings were on Friday nights, we would go to the taping of, of that. And that was super fun. And, that was been great. You know, I'm still a kid. It's not like I'm hanging out with, you know, the cast of Sanford and Son. No. Well, I was thinking that uh, it was probably a pretty dangerous thing to be hanging out with Red Fox. I remember him. He he called me Little Turtle. Yeah. He called my dad Turtle. And then I'd be Little Turtle. <laughs> I distinctly remember uh, uh, some dirty jokes at that time. I was 11, 12 years old. I saw him play in Vegas once, and he was literally like the filthiest, the filthiest comedian I've it. ever heard in my oh, life. Really? And it was way, that was his thing. And that was uh, a way to get a lot of attention and do what he did. But it was also what was filthy now would be considered normal. Right. Um, but I will say I kind of stole a line of his in a way. I We were in the audience. I was, I think, probably 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. And Red Fox started talking to the audience. And there were two bald guys there. And he said, you guys come up here. And he put their heads together. And he goes, look. He goes, look, a butt. <laughs> <laughs> now... When you're 12, that's maybe the funniest thing ever. Yeah. Ever. <laughs> so I stole that image. And in Cool Runnings, we have this thing where this guy says, how about I draw a line down the middle of your head and it'll look like a butt. I love and it. that idea for that, I stole from Red Fox. So I love it. <laughs> See, it all comes together. That's where being on a set as a kid gets you uh, to be uh, funnier when you're directing movies later on. Okay. Very true. Very true. What stuck in my mind was he called a woman's private parts a tomahawk wound. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but of course it was quick in your head. And how old were you and heard that? Under 60, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. Under. That'd be horrible. Yeah, no wonder that stay in your head is right. In Vegas. <laughs> in Vegas. But Crazy. boy, he was really funny. He yeah. was really funny. My big claim to fame is I went to a taping of What's Happening Yeah, for what I think of as one of the definitive 70s sitcom moments, okay? This is the episode where the cast of What's Happening become friends with the Doobie Brothers. Uh. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The Doobie Brothers come, and they needed uh, – high school age kids to be in the audience. I was 14 at that time. And it was me and my friend, Ben Tobias, my friend, Robert Bernstein, and one of the other producers, daughters, Jenny Ornstein. And we were in the back of the crowd at the high school 
listening to uh, the Doobie Brothers when Rerun drops his uh, tape recorder and he's been taping the concert. And we, of course, have the job of doing this when the con- when the when the tape recorder falls out. We all go, ooh. <laughs> Another great seventies. <laughs> so seventies. <laughs> so that was uh, that was my big claim to fame. See the That's back. A good me. one. Were the other kids pretty aware that like we were all watching those shows, Sanford and Son, and especially what's happening? Did they know your dad was making those shows? Yeah, you do, but who knows? Look, Robert Bernstein, his mother's Florence Henderson, the star of Brady Bunch. So it's right. not like that he was that impressed, right? Um, it, you know, that's the thing about Beverly Hills. Every person you know is a somebody or their parents or a somebody or their moms is somebody. And it's, it's what it does is it can make you either weirdly spoiled and have a real weird view of the world that's right. skewed, or it makes those things less amazing and intimidating and impressive and you start valuing things that actually matter more than celebrity. Mm-hmm. Both those things can kind of happen when you grow up in that environment. It's true. Yeah. Really true. We've been noticing that. Yeah. I'm sure you've talked to a lot of amazing, interesting people. And yeah. There's, there's probably a, a lot of weird experiences from all that. Yeah, it's hard to is. know how weird it is growing up in Beverly Hills until you're grown up and you're meeting people who didn't grow up in Beverly Hills. Exactly. Right? And there's the good part of that is most people believe they're normal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't understand how weird or different or not so great it could be to grow up in Beverly Hills until much, much later in my life. You know, when I went off to college, even though I'm going now, I'm suddenly in Connecticut with kids who grew up in New York and Massachusetts and all that, and Hollywood is a long way away for them. Mm-hmm. It's not like these were inner city destitute kids either. No, no. Right. you're just with a different version of Beverly Hills for about half the kids. Other, right. But you are, you know, your life is opening up, but you're still in this little bit of a sheltered environment in college um, for me. And then as you get into life, it all starts changing. And I, I loved growing up in Beverly Hills. I thought it was awesome. And we can get way into that, at whatever yeah. the questions are, but um, I definitely benefited from it as a person. It didn't complete me by any means. I found huge gaps in who I was as a person Mm -hmm. as a result of it, but also huge strengths. Right. What are some of those strengths? I mean, we've heard that, you know, one of our guests was saying, which I thought was really dead on, was like, well, it gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah. Absolutely true. And that confidence comes from a lot of places, you know, parents and, and being, look, we're certainly around a lot of divorced parents growing up. Yeah, for sure. Certainly higher than the national average was at that time. But um, you had a lot of success around you. And mm-hmm. It mean it meant that success was very, if not expected, it was certainly normal. And you yeah. didn't feel weird reaching for huge stars and and trying to be amazing as a person. It was expected of you. Right. Um, by, by you, right? You thought, look at all these great things I can be, you know, and it's... It all felt very tenable. Yeah. Right, thank you for putting it that way. And so, you know, the notion of becoming a doctor or a lawyer or whatever was a normal notion. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh comes from the privilege to be able to afford those things and afford those schools and, and see that stuff and that, but that's the benefit. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, and you look at people who grow up who don't see those things in, in, in front of them every day, think, mm-hmm. oh, that's not for me. Well, it was for us. Yeah. Right. But that is our privilege there. And, and, and it was made very, uh, warm and fuzzy also we there was bad stuff but no awesomeness to all of these things for for sure Mm -hmm. and um but you know also the the other thing i will say about beverly hills and and i do believe it, it changed over the years but certainly up till around 1977 78 beverly hills had a very small town feel to it yes right and we knew the Norians who owned the Pioneer, uh, not Pioneer, the, the market. Yeah. Um, 
at that time. And you'd walk by and you'd take an apple and your mom would pay for it later. Or you go to Rudnick's. I remember going to Rudnick's and Marty Rudnick letting me borrow $20 out of the till to go get my dad a Father's Day present. <laughs> and all that, that small town America. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, with it was goofy rich people village. Right. Um, no question. But the fancy stores were on Rodeo. Canon mm-hmm. Beverly had stores for people. Right. Yeah. And That's all gone now. now. It was next to, you know, a, a, a Chinese restaurant and a toy store and a stationery store. Right. right. We- and it wasn't a fancy pants toy store. It was Toy no. Mart. It was a You'd mess. go to Nate Nows and we'd hop over to Toy Mart after and, you right. know, and it's fun. And we were not aware that our sandwich at Nate Nows was $700. No. <laughs> <laughs> But it still wasn't that kind of craziness. And yeah. And then it all started becoming more and more like that. Beverly Hills started marketing itself and sure. making itself that thing. And so the whole culture changed. So I don't know if it's the same for kids now. I don't know that there's a place for a kid to go run in and buy a pair of underwear and socks. Right. No. At all. Or goldfish or all the normal things we could do. Woolworths. Woolworths yeah. was a normal place with a, a luncheonette counter and you go and get art supplies there and it was a totally normal thing. That's yeah. that real estate for Woolworths now it would it, hundreds of millions of dollars. Oh, oh yeah. for sure. Great. Well, we only got to spend one year overlapping with you at high school, but you seem to be in complete control and a guy who just completely loved high school. <laughs> I think you ruled the school. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I people a lot of people talk about high school is the worst, the most awkward thing, horrible. So I freaking loved high school. It was Was that even yeah. true from the very beginning? Yes. And, and we did too. We, David and I love high school too. Of course, because you're doing the Let's Love Beverly Hills the podcast. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm cutting myself and I have a tattoo on my lip. <laughs> um, podcast. School was hard. I, yeah. you know, it wasn't like I loved high school because it was easy. It was hard, and I stressed. And I would have to have tutor, and SAT was coming. All that stuff was miserable. Junior year was awful. Sure, in terms of that, but not in terms of you know socially. I I found my friends, and yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I was a theater guy, and. Did you do that right from the start? Yeah, I I liked it early on and I wanted to be, I was going to, I thought I'd play tennis and join the tennis team and mm-hmm. uh, try JV, but it, it conflicted with the musical. Right. So I was, oh, this is, you can't do both. Right. Uh, and so, you know, very early on life started Boy, isn't it interesting what it'd be like raising kids where they don't have every opportunity to do absolutely everything they want to do, and then your parents call the school and yell at them because they can't do both. True. We had to make choices. It was hard in Beverly Hills. Yeah. <laughs> I had a pick. So it, you know, or but I, I loved it, and I had heroes and people I looked up to, and people don't realize like theater. Oh, you're a theater geek, or that was a nice word back then. It would be theater F. <laughs> one of the F words. Um, I think most people who listen to our show probably think the theater people were the most popular people in school, but that wasn't the case. It wasn't the case. Was it? Totally, but look, it was, we would joke at the school it was clicky. Why was our school clicky? Cause there were 600 kids there. Yeah. True. Right? You had to find your thing, your group. You have to find your thing. You find your group. There's, I mean, yeah, you know, a lot of people, but if there's 600 students, you're going to find a hundred with your interest. And that's exactly. a big group of people. Yeah. Right. And and you could fill your time with those activities. I way overdid it in the theater department, but I loved it. Why do you love it? Because it's not hard. You don't have to read. You don't have to do math. Right. And there's girls. Right. <laughs> and the theatery girls. So they like talking about your feelings and listening <laughs> to your Um the jocks all hung around other guys. So I don't True. know what was the point of that. Right. Um, so uh, you could, and you knew, this gets back to an early question about uh, being proud and, and being, uh, you were a part of a phenomenal theater department. 
Mm-hmm. You knew you were excellence was expected of you yeah. because you'd seen it. The facilities were amazing. amazing. The talent that came before you was amazing. But also, it's not just, oh, it's rich kids. We would do, you know, competitions. There were these theater festivals. There was a Shakespeare festival one year yeah. and a drama festival the next year and back to Shakespeare Festival. And Beverly Hills High School would win. Um, All the time. And so we put that expectation on ourselves to be phenomenal and mm-hmm. awesome, right? And so, yeah, you tell a kid, go be great, then they go and be great. Yeah. Right. Who were some of the kids that you looked up to when you were young yeah, at Beverly? You came before. Well, the people like before me yeah. were names, like well, I was there when they were there, like Joie Gallo. Okay, she was, oh my God, talented. And James Pepper and um, uh, David Lawrence. Uh, these were like a few years ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Jeanette Goldstein, who Jeanette then became a very successful actress. David became a successful composer. But you saw them in shows. It's funny, I haven't thought about that group above <laughs> right? me. Oh, they were the greatest. Um and then, uh, you know, Michael Lawrence, then before, a year before me, and Pat Cassidy and all these guys. And mm-hmm. you're like, wow, these people are so good. And then yeah. you're suddenly being cast in shows and thinking, I, I'm like that. I have to be that good. And, 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 you, and you worked really hard, but it was really fun. Hard. I'm sure a lot of people, a lot of sophomores and freshmen got into drama because of you. For sure. Fools, morons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you really made it look fun. I, I think you were always with John Travis and you, you guys seem to be having a great time. Well, John Travis was always funnier than I was, but uh, he didn't learn his lines as quickly as I did. Was, <laughs> you, oh, did he get in trouble? But, you know, look, I w- when I did Oklahoma, it was uh, I was in it. Mm-hmm. Josh Finkel had the lead. Josh Finkel ended yeah. up on yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ken Feynman had the female lead. She ended up on Broadway. Yeah. In the show is Nick Cage, who uh, we've heard of him. What happened to him? He didn't make it to Broadway. <laughs> not not on Broadway. He's in the show, and uh, you know, and there's people who became big stars or big something, just really gifted people. Uh, yeah. Phineas Newborn, who ends up on Broadway. Oh yeah. Uh, so were you thinking about that? Were you thinking about acting? Yeah, because things like directing movies wasn't allowed. Yeah. Uh, if you're that age. The only person talented enough to do something like that was Tina Landau. And I don't know if you ever talked to Tina Landau. She's probably the most talented person Beverly Hills ever turned out. Wow. Brilliant wow. Young woman ahead of her time or or right for her time, created her time. A brilliant woman and uh, uh, bold and smart. And she was directing. Mm-hmm. Right. Wow. The rest of us were goofballs and like, I'm going to be a musical. Um, but I, I went to college thinking about being, you know, of, about acting while in college. Okay. I didn't know okay. that I'd be an actor per se, because that I don't know that that held quite the either intellectual, academic or responsibleness of what would have been expected of my parents. Right. Uh, by me. Um, yeah. Then you go to Westland and my brother follows you there as well. Yes. I directed your brother in a play. I don't know. If oh, you know at that. Wesleyan? Yes. Okay. Your brother, who was a uh, uh, very bright guy, he got into Wesleyan, a hard school to get into. Yeah. The that I got in. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and uh, oddly enough, Wesleyan somehow attracted more talent even than Beverly High did. I mean, we Beverly were going to ask you that. Like, how, why, what, how? Know. We none of us really know. There's something about that school and what they look for in this combination of sort of smart, creative people who are not bookish enough to get into Harvard and Yale, um, but smart enough to go to Wesleyan and not yeah. so overly devoted to the creative endeavor that they're going to just an art school um, that finds this sweet spot at Wesleyan. And look, I was there with your brother who became a lawyer, I think. Yep. What did Brian? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lawyer. right. That shows how good an actor Brian was. <laughs> um, but, um, 
you know, just from Beverly High, with, I was there. Uh, Mike Freeze from Beverly High ended up going, you should interview Mike. You know, Mike grew up in Beverly Hills with a thousand brothers and sisters from Beverly Hills. Yeah. Good one. Mike, makes, Mike, I think, makes $11 billion a year uh, working in the telecom industry. Not bad. Um, and he is, you know, a terrific guy, really uh, amazing. But, you know, and then Wesley and you're surrounded also by other talented people. You know, Michael Bay was there. David Cohan, also Hawthorne, who ended up sure. meeting Will and Grace, is there with Brian um, and others. And it just kept going and going and going. Now, look, none of us are phenomenal and successful while we're at Beverly or while we're at Wesleyan or while we're in college. It's just afterwards, something about that upbringing yeah. beyond the white privilege of it yeah. is there to create success. And I, I do think it has to do with this confidence, this belief in yourself, that a, a sense that you belong. You know, there's, there's real value as a person of feeling that you belong in any room you walk in. Right. Right. And while there is a white privilege to that, it there's plenty of people who also grew up in the same way who just don't have that feeling. Right. Yes. It's probably good manners. Um, but there, there, there's this other thing where you, you feel like, okay, I can handle myself when I get in that room. I can, I, 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 I deserve anything I earn. I mm -hmm. just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And Wesleyan pushes that as well. Um, and so that combination, I think, helps a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Do you think you had phenomenal teachers there as well? Or is it just you think the kids? Well, I, think, I, I, I do know I have phenomenal teachers at Beverly. Yeah. Yes. Certainly John Engel made a huge difference. I was actually chatting with Nick Cage literally three weeks ago. We were talking about John Engel and the difference. Oh, he was amazing. He made, not in my life, but in, in Nick's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's interesting is that John Engel was a very traditional drama teacher who was teaching the theater from a theatrical point of view, not from an internal actor's method-y point of view. Mm -hmm. There were those other teachers who did that. Nick is as methody and dark and all, as possible. He responded far more to John mm -hmm. because there was no bullshit in it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. can I say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can say that. Um, <laughs> and it, it was le legit. And people think of these things as sort of, oh, the musical theater, it's so vapid and shallow. Maybe in some ways, but the approach to it, the work you put in and the, the process is not. Yeah. In fact, you can't fake your way through so much of it. You can't be pretentious and think, oh, I'll just be snotty and get away with it because people will think it's good. You have to deliver the goods. Yeah. Um, and that lesson, um, Nick really bought into that. I bought into that. And mm -hmm. people before us, you know, we it wasn't just why we were there. It's those who came before us, the yeah. you know Albert Brooks and and and, and um, Richard Dreyfus and people like that, who you see their success, and you don't assume oh it by coincidence they went to my high school, yeah, or in spite of the fact they went to my high school, you're thinking that's there's some connection. Yeah, they totally. could do it. I could do it. I'm not that different from them. Right. And, and it goes back to us uh, growing up in these environments and being with all these wealthy people, actors, and you're not intimidated. You have a confidence because it's just your friend's mom or so on and so forth. So you, you feel no, comfortable look, stepping into any room. Look, you're still intimidated. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like you meet Mrs. Brady and say, go get <laughs> right. me some cereal. <laughs> where's, that? where's Alice? You're still, like, <laughs> you're still like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Yeah, but, but it's it, it. There's just an edge of it taken away, and yeah. you know, I'm I now as a movie director. You know, I'll I'll be working with huge, huge, huge stars. I'm still scared of them. I'm still intimidated. Yeah, there's still that air of awesomeness to a big celebrity. Sure, I think it wouldn't be fun without that, right? You want you're a fan. Correct. 
<laughs> you lose you lose your love and passion if you don't have that. Exactly. On the other hand, if you give in to it, then you can't do your job. Yeah. Right. And so you're able to find the sanity to go, okay. Look, also, I would say everybody is a big shot, overly impressive, intimidating celebrity until they're late. And then <laughs> after the first day of them being late, suddenly it's like, okay, that fucker. Oh. <laughs> Enough with you. <laughs> that takes the edge off quick. I'm going to get in trouble if you, you're late again, Mr. Fancy. So get your ass in here. Exactly, exactly. And then after Wesleyan, you it came back to California. Did you know that you wanted to go right into directing, or where did you? Yeah, I, I, you know, I it was theater, theater, theater. That was all that was available really at that time. And I was a senior in college, thinking about suddenly everybody else was applying to like actual jobs at the end, right. of college, like Procter and Gamble <laughs> and places like that. Right. Yeah. Cravath, Swain, and more. Some are interesting. I'm like, who? What? <laughs> I better find something. I better go to grad school or go to New York. And, and I thought, if I go to New York and study theater, become a theater director, and I'm really successful, nobody's still heard of me. I'm not making that much money. And if I make the greatest play ever, 80,000 people will see it. That's it. But if I make a movie, 80 million people might see it. And that sounds a lot more fun. The problem was I didn't know much about making movies. Because you didn't study that at Wesley and you did theater. No, not at all. And right. so and the truth is if you you look at my movie, if anyone ever looks at my movies. Quite a few people have seen your movies. <laughs> no, 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 not enough. Ever enough. It's never enough. <laughs> I mean, I do still direct a little bit like it's a play. Um, I am not cinematic first. There are a lot of filmmakers who really know cinema more than anything else. And such as a guy like Chris Nolan, for example, yeah. or or Wes Anderson, right? I'm more, much more about... What is the play going on here? What do the performers need? What are these actors doing? And let me then take pictures of them doing that. Yeah. Right. More than what's the shot that's really going to evoke the mood. I, I. It's more about letting the actor tell the story and, and standing out. And the director should be invisible. Okay. Is, is, is how I've approached it. Sometimes that's awesome. Sometimes it's not the right approach. And movies sometimes work and don't work because of that. Um, and when you study theater, you know, you're putting on a show. Mm -hmm. I still think of that when I do a movie as I'm putting on a show. Right. My job is to please and, you know, entertain people mm -hmm. more than it is to get nine pretentious friends of mine to pat me on the back and say, let's go have coffee because you're such an auteur. Uh -huh. As a result, if you could see the extraordinary emptiness of awards behind me on the show. <laughs> oh, I just see a curtain. <laughs> you went to film school after Wesleyan. Look, you you graduate medical school, you're a doctor, and you graduate film school, and you're an idiot. You, you got to start. Gotta, <laughs> you just know you're nothing. You're that nothing. kid asking your parents' friends if you can use their house to go film a horrible little short. You're nothing. And so, and the route you take to get your success, there's, if there's a thousand directors, there's a thousand route. Tell us about your route. I got, again, stupid lucky, uh, mixed in with stupid overconfident. And, you know, I would take any, I took jobs. I would take any job and, uh, you know, writing little things if I could, editing together someone's birthday party, right. whatever I could. And, I went in, I had a cousin who, and it's it's funny, and my dad would joke about this all the time. It, my dad never got me a job and would have happily. <laughs> right. Never happened. Did you ask him for help and he tried to help you? Or I got a job. I, I worked for him one summer as a PA, but that, yeah, was, right. you know, that was okay. Good learning and more confidence, I guess, but nothing that was before film school, you know. Um, I had a cousin who worked in the videotape distribution business and had a deal with a small company 
whose producer running the company, another Beverly High, two Beverly High graduates. Okay. Um, Brad Cravoy, one of whom you should talk to. Um, and he was making movies. And I had come out of film school and my cousin said, you should go meet this guy. They make really crappy movies for like $750,000 and you can get a PA job on one of those movies. So I went and met with him to be a PA. Mm -hmm. And I asked if there was a director on the movie. And if not, can I direct it? <laughs> That's a big jump up. <laughs> right, right away. <laughs> I said, this, look, I went to film school. I know two things. I know how to direct movies or be a PA. Yeah. Okay. And if I had to choose, I'd choose the directing job. I'd rather direct. <laughs> and he said, he he's like, well, what do you have in your resume? I go, resume? I can show you my grades. I don't have a resume. <laughs> he goes, well, who do you know? I'm like, what? He's like, well, do you know any actors? I'm like, Brad, we, I went to Beverly High. I know people from Beverly High. I know Jonathan Prince. He goes, Jonathan Prince, he's nothing. He's fun. We love Jonathan, but he's not going to start a movie. I'm like, he, he was in a TV show called Mr. Merlin at the time. But I talked and talked and talked. And he goes, all right, well, let's see. And I, I got the job. That's great. That's awesome. Because I told him how I direct the movie, that he would probably be in good with my cousin. Um, and I couldn't have been cheaper. Right. You know, I made $25,000 for 18 months of work, which even then was below minimum wage. Of course. But yeah. So you do that first film, then how do you parlay that into the big time? By having it not be a horrible financial ruin for those producers who hire you again yeah. to do another movie. Uh -huh. After that, those movies which thank god i mean i was very lucky you talk about luck here's what luck is making movies that are to be sort of tossed away on video shelves and and be a quantity sell i got to make my first movies and no one saw them mm -hmm. right that's a gift it seems like a disaster but it's a gift um because you got to learn you, well you got to learn and and hone your craft right like mm -hmm. And I mean, I literally learn not just that directing, but like I remember showing up the very first day on the set and I pulled the first assistant director aside and said, look, I know how to direct movies. I don't know how to be a director. I, I literally am standing in my car right now with you. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> right, right, right. I got the action and cut part down. <laughs> right, I got that. <laughs> Where I stand. Yeah. Wow. Where, and he was laughing, goes, All right, come with me. And we, here's what we do. Like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think filmmakers below you got to practice on music videos and things like that. Yes. That blew up at that time and started really going. And, and the quantity was so high, they needed young, cheap talent. Yeah. Uh, look, it's always been a cash 22 for anyone in show business. You know, it's hard to get the job without the experience. You can't get the experience until you get the job. All that stuff. Right. Um, at the same time, anybody can succeed from any angle, any point of view. Um, and in fact, it's one of the few places where the outliers have a better chance sometimes. You can't sneak backdoor your way into becoming a trial lawyer. <laughs> right. But you can certainly backdoor your way into directing an Oscar winning movie. Um, so it, it, it's wide open uh, in that sense. Love it. Anyway, after those lousy movies, I got, uh, another chance to direct another lousy movie and it, it, it were, it was bad. I'm telling you it was bad, 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 but, um, it was, a uh, first it was a martial arts movie and it was for kids. So that's like mm -hmm. in the, on the, on the scale of movies you make, it's like <laughs> horn, <laughs> martial arts movie. <laughs> Right. That's, there there wasn't right. a high expectation for that film. Exactly. Right. Here's Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. On here's porn and movies. So, uh, but it clicked. It worked uh, enough. And some executive at Disney, these are all shortened versions of amazing long stories. Yeah. Saw it. Disney bought the movie from the Korean producers who were making the movie who didn't speak English and the Japanese financiers who didn't speak English um, sold the movie off. And I was, that got me into the party. And that got you into Disney. Right. That was Disney bought the movie. The movie is called three ninjas. And oh, yeah. 
did well, and uh, then I'm now allowed. The way I put it was I was now invited to the dance, but no one wanted to dance with me. Now you could make four ninjas. That's if I was like, they did, they went and made sequels. I said, no, please, no. I did. <laughs> oh, my great creative work. <laughs> I exploited all of my genius. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I was at that point being given the very, very bottom of what studios might be making. Because mm-hmm. I was the very, very bottom and everything was not so great. And they were cast offs and maybe we'll make this, maybe not. And I, I was reading it as if I had options. <laughs> and so I'd read a not so great script and go, eh. And, like, and finally my agent said, said, you know, after Three Ninjas came out, you became the flavor of the month. Your month is over. <laughs> yeah, well, it was just find something and just th- go. Just you got to go. So... I said yes to uh, the, the Jamaica bobsled team movie, which was not called Cool Runnings at the time, but eventually became, it was called Blue Maga. Blue Maga, my gosh. That was a, who would have thunk about the red Maga coming forward? And then it's called Blue Maga, <laughs> and then it was, that's right. Well, we, we crossed paths once again on that one because I had an internship with Dawn Steele while she was working on Cool Runnings. You did? Yeah. <laughs> before I got there? I think before you got there, there was like a British director on board. Brian Gibson, I think. Yeah, that's it. Um, oh, my he, God. Who directed What's Love Got to Do With It, the Tina Turner Oh, movie. that was good. And the movie was a drama set in like the rough and tumble streets of Kingston and uh, the the life and getting these kids out of the – the life in Kingston and turning them into bobsledders and all that stuff. And then at some point they said, let's make it a comedy. <laughs> let's, make it seriously. let's make it superficial and funny. I know right. Tom Turtle Town. <laughs> let's give it to him. <laughs> give it to him. So yeah. And then, so I did cool run. It was just a miracle, but here, here, I'll tell you one story of my Jewish mother from Beverly Hills. So I remember being told I got the job. And my first call was to my parents and my mom answers the phone. My dad's on the phone. I said, you won't believe this. I finally got a job working for a studio, a real Hollywood studio movie for Disney. Oh my God, what is it? I said, well, it's about the Jamaican bobsled team and we get to go shoot in Jamaica for six weeks and we shoot in Canada for six weeks. There's a pause and my mom says, how do you pack for that? <laughs> good, good question. <laughs> yeah, brother. Only in Beverly Hills would a Jewish mother worry about that. So that's all it was. You can't pack. It's too hot. It's too it's cold. Too it's too hot. Too what cold. am I going to bring? What's John going to bring? Correct. <laughs> to Jamaica. I love it. Was that fun working with John Candy? It was the best ever. The most fun. That's a perfect example of we were talking about before meeting a famous person and a celebrity and I was totally enamored and it was bad. Cause like I was giggly around. <laughs> you were He's funny. And I, <laughs> it was horrible. And I, I couldn't be bossy or anything, but my sense of humor and all that, he respected me and liked me. And then Good. we ended up having my mother. It's funny. One of the turning points was my mother sent me a Nate and Al's dried salami. Uh, <laughs> he, he must've loved it. <laughs> all the way to Jamaica. All the way to Jamaica. We found a way to smuggle in a Hebrew national dried salami into Jamaica. <laughs> This is my great. Everyone in Jamaica, Jamaica is like drugs are going out. I'm bringing oh, some of these in. Yeah, and, and we got it in, and we were on the set. And this is how John Candy was so perfect. I, uh, he's sitting. We're in this set, and I said, "You know what, John? Come in, come in one sentence earlier, and come in, uh, make an earlier entrance." And he goes, "No, you're not the boss of me." <laughs> <laughs> um, kiddingly, he was the way. Of yeah, saying. of course. And I go, and he goes. I go, John, I have the salami. <laughs> he goes, okay, you're my boss. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we had a 
cool. And I love so much that your mother sent you salami from Nate and Alice to Jamaica. Can I tell you, I could have sold slices of that salami for thousands of dollars. That's unbelievable. Rather than having to eat one more bun and cheese or meat patty, that oh was so good. <laughs> we also we also had to smuggle in a shank bone and a roasted egg. Not a roasted egg, just a shank bone and some uh, horseradish because I had Passover while well, yeah. there. I was going to say for Passover. Passover. I did. We did a Passover Seder at the hotel for a whole bunch of people, and it was hilarious and uh, really funny. And that fun. must have been fun. That's fun. great. I love so many that. people came, like, what is Passover? Come on, I'll show you. That's kind <laughs> of fun. What's great is the, the Rastas knew more about the Jewish stuff than almost anybody else. That's what was oh. crazy. Did they? Yeah. Very cool. I love that. That's Who very knew? cool. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Then you start a string of films with your old buddy from high school, Nicolas Cage. Did you ever think that would come about? Why did I not think it? I didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> because you had gone to high school with him? Because anybody you go to high school with, you figure, eh, how big a deal could that guy be? Well, how good is he? <laughs> Nick, was, Nick read my mind one. He, he just knew. I, I, was in, I was at Wesleyan. And he was on the cover of GQ. Mm-hmm. And at one point he goes, it must have killed you. You were in college being in your little plays. And there I was in the cover of GQ. You must have hated me. <laughs> How great is like, that? Yes, that's exactly what? right. I did. But I had gotten the lead in our town over Nick at, at Beverly. So okay. I knew I was a far better actor than Oscar winning Nick Cage. Yes, of course. Um, but. There he goes, marrying everybody and starring in things and making millions and millions of dollars and having fancy friends. And I'm like in my school play, hoping that nine <laughs> people will come to, to see my little show. Um, so then when, when National Treasure comes up and it was Jerry Bruckheimer was loving on Nick. And, it, you know, it's always hard. I had seen Nick do a few things where I thought, oh, my God, he really is great. Um, yeah. But you all see other things where you see the person in that you see the acting because you know the person so well. Right. right. It's really unfair. But any person you know well or grew up with, you just look at them when they're acting and think, you're an idiot. That's not real. That's you right. faking your voice. That's, right. that's not what Daniel Day Lewis does. Of course, it's what Daniel Day Lewis does. But that's some of Nick's brilliance, though, is how far he no, takes okay. that. And there was, but then I thought, you know what? There's, there's, there's something about Nick that wasn't really quite in the character. I thought, you know, what? Th- if we adjust a little bit to the Nickness of it, yeah, um, and I can find, you know, another thing. And Nick was very smart about it. Like the the word I use to describe the character is Ben Gates, the lead in National Treasure, because mm-hmm. Nick had to be talked into doing it. Convinced why he's a big star. What does he want to do this movie? Yeah. But the word I used to describe him was audacious. Mm. And that audacity appealed to Nick because that's who Nick is, right? Okay. To do the thing you shouldn't do that everyone says not to do that, re- but you know is going to be the winner. Right. It's it's the crazy route. That's who this guy is in that movie and that's who Nick is. But then I have to say, but you do things, but you're not that guy. You're not crazy, Nick. You're really well-educated, Nick. And the fun thing is the audacity that that pretty serious, smart guy has to do the crazy thing. Right. And that mix he he really liked to see a sane person do crazy things rather than a crazy person do crazy things. Right. Um, and all that. And it was a really good. Uh, good magic. Yeah, really you good. You guys nailed that. Was it fun though working with him though, even though like you grew well, up? Like yes. is it kind of is it kind of cute, kind of fun that you knew each other and well that, that was one of the things where for the first time I wasn't all complete I was a little intimidated because not only was Nick a big star and had worked with bigger, badder directors than than me, certainly. Um, but he's also really good and talented. And in high school, he was really cool. But also Nick could beat the crap out of me. <laughs> Right, I'm not known for my muscles, and Nick's ripped. And he was into the martial arts and all that. Correct. Oh yeah, he was, he was like a badass. <laughs> he was a big martial arts guy in high school, and 
Uh, so there was, look, Nick had chest hair and muscles right. at a time when no one had chest hair or muscles. And it was the girls at Beverly Theater probably were like, oh, this cool New Yorker. He told everyone he's a New Yorker. He was from Long Beach. <laughs> okay. He must have gone to one of the elementary schools, too, because I remember meeting him like I was in fifth grade and he was in summer school with me in Beverly Hills. Maybe really? he knew him because his dad had an apartment in Beverly Hills. His mom lived in Long Beach. He kind of grew up in Long Beach, sort of shuttled back and forth. He had a really, really rough for Nick growing up. No split house, but his, and his mom had some health issues and all kinds of stuff. So Nick was always an outsider and an outcast, but connected to some passion. And he, you know, his father, brilliant poet and, and literary kind of genius, but also his uncle being Francis Ford Coppola had this, you know, gave Nick this sense of purpose and belonging that there's greatness to my world. There's greatness sure. available to me, like we were talking about. Yeah. And that whole family benefited from it. And people don't realize it's not just Nick Coppola and Sophia Coppola. Sophia. But, but th there's also not just Jason Schwartzman, who's a Coppola, uh -huh. but Jason's brother, John Schwartzman, was the DP on National oh. Treasure. Oh, oh, wow. And The Rock. And all his, it was a brilliant cinematographer. Mm. So this family has like turned out a lot of talent and a lot of confidence. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think Nick was brilliant. He beat Brian in the eighth grade speech competition too. Really? Ooh. Yeah, he was. Had, had it been at Beverly Vista? I think he went to Beverly Vista for a while. Yeah, he must have. Yeah. He must have. But then he went away, and then he came back to Beverly, I think, his sophomore year or something like that. I thought, I, you know, I didn't know anything of his family or anything. I saw him on the playground, and I thought he was like the Fonz. He was he like. Was like the he Fonz. was the Fonz. <laughs> yeah. But he was from Fonzie because he was from Long Beach. Yeah. He was the Fonz. That That's summer, great. I felt like Richie Cunningham, and he was the Fonz, and I was just like wow. in awe of this guy. <laughs> and he was like, That's he wore awesome. a leather jacket. He would bounce this ball yes. and bounce it back to himself. That's so awesome. Nick was our Fonzie. That's so true. And Nick is like the greatest. He is, there's no question. I mean, the public thinks, oh, he's so weird and crazy. Well, he is weird, but he's not crazy. He's yeah. an interesting, fun, odd guy. But I also say this. I don't know. Very few actors in his position show up every morning, never late, always knows his lines, Always there, always has an idea, never difficult, never yelling at anyone, always a gentleman, total pro good man. And you're thinking, oh boy, it's going to be Nicolas Cage. He's going to start eating bugs. Um, <laughs> it's, he's not that guy. He's really just a good, sweet person. Yeah. No, I, I always loved him, even starting from Valley Girl. Yeah. Well, my fave. Back, to back to fifth grade. My fave. Me. I was Leather a jacket, a lot of muscles. <laughs> a lot of muscles, a lot of Fonzie. Hey. So do you get a deal with Disney where you're just going to make films with Disney for a long time? It seemed that way. And I did. I had this little deal with Disney. And it just every good movie I read was them. Uh -huh. And I just kept making movies for them and movies for them. And eventually, you know, Disney and I, you know, the people changed there. I started reading things other places that I really liked. And, uh, I haven't made a movie with them since 2010, I think. Mm. I have a couple of things I'm developing with them, but uh, yeah. that was the last thing with them. Um, it was great. I, I mean, I spent 20 years of my career sort of incredible in the Disney universe. So, Did you get to go to Disneyland a lot for free? Yes. <laughs> Duh. Do, you still have Duh, a, do you still have a free pass anytime? I don't. Oh, no. I don't. I had to give oh. up the free pass. Although... It's funny when I lost the free pass. It's a great name droppy story, but it's not name droppy because it's about a famous person. Right. I was, I told Tom Hanks, I I showed him my he he uh, produced a, a a mini series for HBO called From uh, From the Earth to the Moon, and we filmed that at the Disney MGM Studios. That's what it was called in in Orlando. Uh -huh. And I did an episode of that. It was one of the greatest experiences directing certainly of my life. Um, because I became friends with Tom Hanks. Yay! <laughs> but 
at one point I said to Tom, see this? This is called a red VIP pass. This gets me into Disneyland anytime I want. And you don't <laughs> have one. And he goes, oh, I have a better pass. It's right here. And he pointed to his face. <laughs> <laughs> Because this gets me into Disneyland anytime I want. I can get like, to all the special places. Exactly. I was like, go, oh, Tom Hanks, you win again. <laughs> what was the coolest thing you did with the at Disneyland or with the Disney people? You know, the best thing was, I mean, there have been some really good ones. Back in the day when Disney was a company and not Disney, ABC, ESPN, and 5,000 other things. Yeah. They had, they would have their Christmas party every year at Disneyland, mm-hmm. wow. and the park closed at like ten. Yeah, and any and all the employees could stay, and they kept the park open for that. Um, and so there, you go on all the rides, and there's no line, there's no nothing. Um, I never liked the jump ahead of the line thing because then you get to jump out of the line, but then you feel like the guy who jumped out of the line. Yeah, but this was like the park was open. We also had a, a private party in Florida once, and they just kept a section of Disneyland open hmm. um, just for the party uh, and all that. I had the premiere of a movie I did uh, for them called The Kid uh, with Bruce Willis and oh, yeah. Norman. And it was during the day, but it, we everyone got to go around and, and go on all the rides and all that stuff. And we owned Autopia that day. Oh, yeah, I love that. <laughs> as much as you wanted. Were you part of the senior class that took the Autopia cars off the track at senior Disneyland day? I can't tell you. I, that was the year before me. And oh. how dare they? How I dare they? There's a holiness to Disneyland. And don't be that person thinking you're more important than Disneyland. Put that damn car back on the track. Okay. Exactly. That's really- don't mess with Disney. It's just kids having fun. No, you're just teenagers <laughs> thinking you're better than being, other people. Being an idiot. Don't grow up. Where can we get to my favorite part of what John does now? Yeah. Okay. So, John, all I can tell you is your wonderful, awesome career. And other than you being so cool, I love more than anything that you actually did something to save our democracy by working oh. with the Lincoln Project. I didn't know where this was going. Dude, oh. it's everything. You're everything oh. to me. You're my hero. Here's what I'll say about the Lincoln Project. I've never had better producers of anything i've ever filmed it was crazy i got put together with them i got i was on like a fundraising phone call someone invited me to do and i'd seen a couple of their things and i'm on a zoom call and on the zoom call are all these really cool people and not just like like steve schmidt no cooler like steve kerr Uh. (laughs) (laughs) um but I'm seeing Steve Schmidt and, and and Rick Wilson and those guys and and um, Susie Schuster, who is a friend of mine, put me on with them. And I said to her, I have a really good idea for a video for them. She goes, hang on, hang on, hang on. And then she comes back on the phone with Rick Wilson and one other person. And she goes, what's the idea? I'm like, wait, what? What? What they are so great at is saying yes hmm. and just do it right now. Go. There, there's a, a a charge ahead. Don't ask questions. We'll worry about whether this is a good idea later. Okay. That creates success. That creates product. That gets yeah. things done. Mm-hmm. Hollywood is all about asking questions and worrying and maybe and should I and will I get in trouble and this one said no and I could maybe and don't get mad at me. Yeah. The I, I pitched them the idea and they said, all right, go make that. And I'm like, wait, what? I said, well, let me send you a script. Okay. I wrote a script out. They read and go, okay, go make that. I said, well, don't you have notes? Well, we'll see. Just go make it. Yeah, but don't just make it. Just okay. do it. So I just did it. And uh, and it's really good. Wake up. Um, I loved it. Thank you. It was thank great. You. And, you ha- and you're saving our world, our United States. Or what- It got to the point where, and I, I want to, because I, I know plenty of people who are on all sides of politics. and. Sure. And Trump became very much a, a tipping point because it was – this had nothing to do with conservative and liberal. This, no. this had to do with evil and hateful. Agree. And, and believing in more than 
that. So that's where I split and, and had to really get in there. But look, it came well, out great. You. It got uh, a lot of views and it, it made you want to interview me, Stacey. So it did. <laughs> it did. That's the only reason. David's like, John Turtletop. I'm like, well, he did Lincoln Project stuff. I'm there open to this. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Count me in then, David. <laughs> Your dad had me at Sanford and Son. I, I just love that oh, show. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot too. That's a interesting story as well. Like he, my dad you know, really in my parents, you know, you open your kids up to things by doing them and setting examples and being political and, and in, in all things you do and, and letting your kids know about the goods and the bads and, sure. and the difficulty of being the white Jewish producer of an all black television show and the difference you can make and the yeah. blame you take and the people you anger on all sides yeah. when you do it and how you, respond to those things there were just endless lessons at home because of that stuff yeah um, so. well it's amazing and you're doing a lot of other uh charitable works or out there being involved in everything uh one is an orphanage in kenya yeah it's fine my wife uh amy is uh, grew up in kenya oh okay. and she uh i like to tell people i have an african-american wife in case that Makes people think I'm cool, but she's blonde and, and half British and, and, um, and African and African American are very different things. Very. Uh, she grew up in Kenya and in, in Nairobi, and her dad still lives there and does a lot of work there and helped start an orphanage and wow. I'm very involved in that. But you know, it, it's so easy, and this can get us back to where we started. You know, if I had married the nice Beverly Hills girl that I was supposed to marry, I would have had a great life, but I would have had a small life. Mm -hmm. um, and in marrying Amy and someone who grew up far from that world mm -hmm. and without money and in Nairobi where there's nothing and having a big world view versus a very small power view. Mm hmm my life would be very different. Very. Yeah. Successful, happy, I'm sure fine, but not as fulfilling and, and big. Yeah. And is. rich, rich with uh, experiences and um, just exposure and what you expose your children to. And you know, we need to use those of us who grow up with all this great goodie, all the goodies of Beverly Hills need mm -hmm. to use that stuff to expand our worlds and use that success to make ourselves fuller, bigger people and that make the world a better place, not think the wonderfulness of our Beverly Hills life is an end in and of itself. Right. Yeah. It's other people's goals in a lot of ways to get here and be successful here and all that. We started on third base. Exactly. But, but boy, there's a lot out there that – you have this extraordinary ability to experience and, and make better mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. because you have the comfort of this other thing. And I, I wanted it. I, I, I tried for it. I, but I easily could have been seduced in my life back into a very happy Beverly Hills life. For sure. For sure. Um, and my wife gave me the way out. So I didn't just, let that be all I was. Great. I love that. And you also help young filmmakers too, right? Yes, but that's not because I'm wonderful. That's because they don't stop asking. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Given the choice yeah. of helping a filmmaker and staying at home and playing Minecraft, uh, we know what I'd pick. Yeah, exactly. I love it. Well, what was the Inner City Filmmakers Project? That's an amazing program. And that's, yeah, that, and that's done partially with USC and a guy named Fred Heinrich, who I got to know, just gave his whole life to this. And again, what do you do in with a company town where there's jobs and show business is get people who don't get exposure to that educated and available and learn the skills to go out and, and do stuff. And they, they learn uh, the movie business a little bit. And again, we get too stupidly myopic thinking, oh, you should learn how to direct movies. No, learn how to do wardrobe for a movie. Right. Yeah. Learn special effects. Learn. That's where all the jobs are. And yeah. that's success. Yeah. Right. 
Oh, you I know? always thought the most successful people I actually knew in film school were the people who said, I'm going here and I'm going to learn everything about sound. Like yeah. they could get a job yeah. the day they left school. That's right. And the directors were like, just people who thought they were great. Yeah. Um, well, like yourself. Like me. <laughs> Except I was great. Just not. I am great. great. <laughs> How do you deal with, you must get a call every week at least of somebody saying, oh, my kid, he wants to be a filmmaker. Get him a job. You know, it, it, obviously there's a lot of it and it's, it, yeah, you get it. You understand, you know how hard it is and yep. you know how weird it is. The annoying thing, frankly, is the read my script mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that, that takes, uh, that takes time. time. That's not just, oh, I'll be nice and have a quick conversation with you. Right. It takes a lot of time. You got to find the time. You have to take time out of what else you are doing that mm -hmm. matters to you. And then you got to tell someone how shitty their script is. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> because it will be. Most are. Right. The odds are that most are bad. They wouldn't be sending it to you if they were that good at it. <laughs> right. They would have a job. It is this grand mystery show business. And so when people want to talk, they think you're going to give them the magic formula or tell them what the secret password is to get in. I wanted it when I was starting and I met with people expecting them to tell me what that, you know, formula. the recipe for the secret sauce. And there isn't one. Right. There just isn't. To, you, you, you figure your own out, mm -hmm. right? There's mistakes. There's bad things you can do, but mm -hmm. you can't make yourself a success just by wishing it. There's 80,000 things you have to do and 80,000 miracles that have to happen. Yeah, and you don't right. have control over all those. That's right. Yeah. I mean, nobody that's could right. take your path. No. And I mean, mine was mine and Spielberg's was Spielberg's. And right. everybody's got some and some are just pure luck and you go how did that person get there and they're terrible and they keep succeeding sure you know there's tons of people we all know who are better than the ones who are working who just can't they didn't make it just keep at it as long as it's not costing you I, right there's so many people you want to tell stop following your dreams <laughs> <laughs> Dream. Right. The whole business of oh, just you know, you just dream it, you can be it, or whatever. It is. No, that that that's really bad advice to yeah. tell people. Right, right. You you can't succeed without believing in yourself. Sure, but believing in yourself isn't going to make you succeed. No, it's just you know, put fuel in the tank. Yeah, exactly. Well. This was amazing. Oh, it was John, really amazing, John Turtle Top. I think it's the best podcast you've had yet. Could be. Uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to agree with you. You and can't thank agree you. unless you cut that out because now you just made the other people feel bad. <laughs> John, it was so much fun. Thank you so much. It was really great taking that trip down Cannon Drive with you. Thank <laughs> you. Well, it was so fun having you on. We loved it and a great having you on. Thanks again for coming on Growing Up Beverly Hills. Bye. 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 Welcome to the Beverly Hills Breakdown. Bum, bum, bum. It's the breakdown, David. Let's do this. I think for this breakdown, we're only going to talk about people. I guess so. I didn't feel like John was a terrible name dropper. He had something about like when it's not name dropping, if the story happens to involve that guy, but. I think so. We got a couple names here that we had to break down, so. We extracted a lot of these names out of John. You know what? It was a great conversation. So let's just clear up any questions that people might have at the end of the show, and we can let them know all about John Turtletop's friends. Okay. Well, here's a person we forgot to mention, which I feel really bad about. His father made What's Happening, and he told the story about how he was uh, there on the set for a, a very eventful time with the Doobie Brothers, but... I remember Dee was maybe a year older than us, and she went to Beverly Hills High School. Dee from What's Happening, her real name is Danielle Spencer, and the show played from 1976 to 1979, and it truly was one of my most favorite shows. And I think, David, you have a story about Danielle Spencer. Well, I had PE with her. That was the only class we ever took together, and we would have to run laps, and we were both uh, more walkers than runners. <laughs> And uh, I remember 
hearing her swear quite a lot, which was kind of shocking for me because here you see this girl on television and then you hear her swearing. Uh, that might have been a little weird. Then he mentioned a lot of people he looked up to when he was like young at Beverly and these people were all in the theater department. And one was Jeanette Goldstein, and she's just done tons of movies and TV shows, including Aliens, ER, and 24. But if you look at IMDb, she has an interesting part. She played Beverly Hills Chick Number 1 in the film Miracle Mile. Woo! At Beverly Hills Chick Number 1, always welcome on our show. She was born to play that part. Mm-hmm. Oh, maybe then we talk about um, two brothers, David and Michael Lawrence. They're the sons of Edie Gourmet and Steve Lawrence. Unfortunately, Michael passed away at an early age of 23 by an undetected heart condition. However, his brother David went on to become quite a composer. He has done a huge career in television and movie scores, and he really is probably very famous for doing all the music for all of the high school musicals. Very cool. And he also brought up Pat Cassidy. Oh, yeah. Pat Cassidy we love because, first of all, Ryan is our age. And the Cassidy is a very famous family of actors. They are the sons of Shirley Jones and Jack Cassidy. There are three boys, Sean, Ryan, and Patrick. And they have an older stepbrother, half-brother, actually, David Cassidy, who was a major heartthrob when we were growing up in the 70s. But just an incredible family. Patrick Cassidy went on to have a quite a career as a stage actor on Broadway and in television. And just what a, an incredible family in Beverly Hills. And we love the Cassidys. If only they had some talent. <laughs> if only. Totally talented all around. Then he mentions Phineas Newborn, who I remember seeing in a lot of productions. And I think he might have also been a dancer at Beverly probably was because he went on to do Broadway and was in a lot of dance films like Fame, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, and Breakin'. For sure. Yep, he knew how to get down. Then John says he thought the most talented person to ever go to Beverly was Tina Landau. And he said she was directing back then. And then she became a director. She is a theater writer, director, and educator. And she worked with the Steppenwolf Theater Company for many years directing and might still be doing that and made her Broadway directing debut in 2001 with Bells Are Ringing. And she even did the SpongeBob SquarePants musical. So fun. Quite a talent, Tina Lando. She is. We got to have her on the show. Uh, my brother's friends with her sister. Anyone shout outs? We'd love her on. Brian, get on it. <laughs> Brian. Then we talk about Mike Freeze, and he said he is the most, um, I guess, the most uh, person that made the most money that came out of Beverly High. <laughs> he might be up there. I don't know. <laughs> he's, way, he's way up there. He's had a huge business career. He's the CEO and the vice chairman of Liberty Global, which is a company that basically is a, you know, in the cable and media industry, and he's seen this company grow into this huge huge firm. So Mike Freeze, congratulations. Beverly was good to you. <laughs> <laughs> He's also went to Wesleyan with my brother oh, yeah. and, and John and is uh, a big fundraiser there, I think on the board or whatever, the trustees, one of yeah. the major trustees there. Very cool. Then he brought up Brad Cravoy and he was the founder of of the Motion Picture Corporation of America, which is also called MPCA. And he went from there to become the co-president of Orion, but then decided to restart MPCA and make independent films again. Some of the films he's responsible for are Dumb and Dumber mm. and Beverly Hills Ninja. Woohoo! Beverly Hills again coming up. I love that film. I just watched it recently with my daughter. Did you? Yeah. Very nice. Got to keep yourself very freshened up on all be things Beverly Hills, David. Yes. Well, that's it for the breakdown. We did it again. Remember to like us and follow us and leave us five stars and subscribe. And tell all your friends to keep listening to Growing Up Beverly Hills. Till next time. Bye. 
So suicide has personally affected my life. And we like to mention at the end of our show that there is help for everybody out there. You know, I think everybody's going through a tough time now, and we don't want anybody to take their lives. Especially during this COVID situation, uh, we've all been experiencing depression and hard times. Things can always get better. Everything bad now can get better. Everything can get better, and there is a lot of help out there. So please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at one 800 273 8255. There is always help. It doesn't hurt to call, so do that. You don't have to do this alone. There's always help. 